thank you, Mr. Chairman. My presentation is about the technological needs of the small-scale mining industry, with special emphasis on the processing techniques. There are several areas where the small-scale mining industry needs technology. And it appears in these days it has been on the table and several fora have discussed issues about small-scale mining. There are needs in prospecting, mining, mineral extraction, tailing, disposal, land reclamation in all these areas. But I would focus more on maybe mineral extraction and tailing disposal under our current discussion. So we will talk about rock fragmentation, we will look at mineralogy issues, size of gold relative to the grind size that the small scale miners use. We will talk about the particle shape and its relation to concentration as used by small scale miners, some sluice mats, mercury use, and then tailings disposal. This is a map of Ghana showing some of the minerals that are mined at the small scale level. We have gold virtually scattered all over the country, construction materials, diamonds, and salt also somewhere there along the coast. The small scale mining sector is large now. As of February 2017, we had about 1,500 registered miners. And as we always say, it's estimated at about 1 million. And according to UN convention, if a unit has 1 million workers, it means that it takes care of about 6 million people. And that means that the small-scale mining sector actually takes care of a quarter of the Ghanaian population, and it's a very important sector. In 2016, they produced 1.15 million ounces of gold, which is about 31% of the national gold production. If you look at this graph, it shows a low of 2.2 .2 in 1989, up to about 36%, 34%, sorry, um, from about 2014 to 2015, and there was a drop in 2016. Not because the production itself went low, but because Asanko came on board and they produced a lot. Yeah, boss is here, and you can confirm that. So we would walk ourselves through some of the extraction techniques and we will talk about the technology or the needs that can be brought on board as we move along. Small scale miners like all other companies do their rock fragmentation by blasting, it can be by chiseling or by thermal stress cracking. Some also go ahead to use excavators, though at the moment the use of excavators is against the law. But they do it. Virtually everybody uses the excavator. I think maybe we have to look at that law and also the people, how they work and see how best we can fuse the law and the activity for the benefit of the nation. These miners sometimes have some dangerous activities going on there. And the last time we were training some small scale miners and I showed them some of the things they have been doing and I told them to tell me what was wrong with it. And indeed they told me a lot of the things that they were doing wrong. And then we went ahead to discuss what they can do to make things better. You can see that this is not correct. This is mad and it can slide down and bury them at the least movement. They have some slopes that are so steep you are not sure what will happen. It's like a vertical wall and people just moving down there with a the rope. Many things can go wrong in a pit like that. And the mining engineers here, I believe we have a lot of work to do. Nobody owns a concession on a river. And therefore, whenever you see somebody mining on a river, it means he's doing an illegal activity. I think it is important for the Navy to come in at this particular point. Because though we talk about the Minerals Commission, people say the Minerals Commission is like the DBLA. They issue the license, but they don't enforce it on the road. So we need an enforcement agency that can really hit it and hit it hard um, to bring sanity in the system. Size reduction, in, this is a typical small-scale underground mine, where they have the pillar that is supporting the roof. But because they are in discipline, with time they start chopping the pillar, and then it becomes thin, and then they have to reinforce it with some metal uh, poles. You can see the stress on the poles or the pipes. It means that it can cave in, and the whole system can be a problem. 
Normally, small scale miners do not do any mineralogical study on their work, on their ores. And therefore, immediately they pan a little bit and they see specks of gold, then they realize that, oh, we can go ahead and mine here. But as you and I know, sometimes we can have a single pyrite, you can have pyrite in there. And therefore, when they mine such ores and they grind, they expect that these ores will yield their gold. When they grind they do not get anything, then it appears as if some dwarfs came around when they were working and carried the gold away. And we encounter some of these things on the field, and any time you do some scientific probing, you realize that it's not a dwarf that came around, but it's normally sulfides that occlude the gold and therefore prevent maximum recovery. So mineralogy is one side of the story that small scale miners are missing. At the moment, we are having a training program um, at UMAT campus and we are talking about mineralogy and how they can use it to their advantage to increase their output. Again, particle size is very important. Small scale miners use several kinds of equipment. You can talk about the disc mill, the hammer mill, the um, ball mill and so many others. But then they do not do that relative to the size of gold in the sample that they are processing. Our studies show that for many of these alluvial samples. This would be the array of gold particles that you will find. Many of them are above 0 0.125 millimeters and therefore you can easily get them by simple methods. But the ones that they have to grind, the gold is actually below this 0.125 and therefore it becomes difficult taking a lot of these particles out, having in mind that most of the conventional gravity concentration equipment may not be able to capture these fine particles. It means that most of the gold at the end of the day will be locked up in the tailings because typically small scale miners grind up to 425 microns. So if you grind 425 microns, it means you are here. And therefore you will recover only the ones that are here and this will be left in the tailings. That is why some large scale mines are able to buy small scale mining tailings and get a lot of gold out of it. Because most of the gold will not be liberated by the um, size reduction equipment that are used by the small scale miners. Typically, they, have, they use the disc mill, um, which we normally call the corn mill. The one we have called the corn mill will be a disc mill used in grinding corn. They have a disc mill used in grinding ore. The grinding surfaces here are not strengthened and captured enough for rock grinding. So at the moment in our labs on UMAT campus, one of the researches we are doing is to go next door to Insuta, get some manganese, and then link up with some of these artisans who produce their discs so that they can get harder ones that they can use for um, the work that they do. Our work at the moment indicates that when you grind, when you use up to 12% manganese, it becomes so hard that there's no local drill that can hit it. In the mining companies, they use normally 12% to 14% manganese for their surfaces. But then, our work locally indicates that when you use that one, you can't even get a local drill to be able to push it through, to be able to fix it, as you can see here. So, normally around 4% to 6%, you are able to get something which is slightly hard and can be drilled and fashioned easily for local use. They normally use hammer mills also and these are the hammers again we are working with the local artisans to cast hammers that are that contain about four to six percent manganese so that they can use it for a much longer time and not have to um, change it every 24 hours as they do these days they can also use a ball mill but at the moment most small scale miners do not use ball mills mainly because of how the discharge from ball mills are handled one would expect that the discharge from a ball mill will go through um, a classification operation. But they don't use classification systems. And therefore, at the moment, the two small scale miners that I'm aware who use ball mills, their discharge is processed by screens and it places some kind of um, hindrance to maximizing their efforts. We did some work on the type of gold particles that come out from each of the grinding units. If you use a hammer mill to grind, the particles come out as spheres. If you use a disc mill, they come out as cigar-shaped particles. Those that use stamp mills, this is how the particles are, and these are gold particles from a ball mill. 
if you look at the curve here, this is a small one, we are not doing fluid mechanics, but it gives an indication here that when you have a sphere, the drag coefficient on the sphere is much, much lower than the cylinder, a disc, and a plate. It means that if anybody uses this machine to grind his ore, when he starts doing gravity concentration, the drag force on the particle will be so high that the gold will float on the water. If you use a disc mill, the drag force, if you use a disc mill, these cylinders, the drag force will also cause some of them to just roll to the tailings because they are just hollow cylinders. But the hammer mill is able to do a better job because these spheres have got a very low drag force and they can settle easily during gravity concentration. What this means is that when you are on the field, we did some study with some miners and we realized that because the hammer mill material is able to come out as spheres, it will be preferable that after hammer milling, you do direct gravity concentration. Instead of saying that the particles are too big and therefore they have to go directly to a disk mill, you do your gravity concentration immediately after hammer milling and the tailings from the spheres will now go to the disk mill and then you sluice that one again and you get your final tails. On the field, those who work with hammer mills alone are able to recover so much gold from one ore. If you combine hammer mill followed directly by this milling, you recover about 7.5. But those who are able to do hammer milling, get the gold out, and later do this milling on the tailings are always able to maximize their profits. So we developed this small flow sheet for them, that those who are ready to improve upon their recoveries should go by this um, simple flow sheet and they can enhance their recovery by more than 50% just by changing the strategy. Typical gravity recovery starts with winnowing, especially in the northern regions where water is very difficult to come by. They take advantage of the high velocity of the winds and therefore the particles that are heavy enough to fall in the pan become the concentrate that the big guys treat and those that fall on the ground um, the people who follow them, especially the ladies, will collect those that fall on the ground and then they do some scavenging operations to also get some gold. This happens in the Nobo, Gaza, Bila, Tongo, all those areas up north. Down south, where we have more water, people use straw mills. So you feed, you have an ore box at this side not captured, you push your material into the ore box and you wash it, this scrubber will wash it out and the fine material will pass over the sleeves board and any gold in there would be concentrated. These straw mills have been used with a lot of success in the alluvial operations. For other operations they have centers where people can take their material to grind it and eventually sleeze it on site, on site and leave their tailings behind. This is an alluvial operation around Kutukrom in the Ankobra zone. And this is both also where they have a center for processing the ore. At the end of the day, you have a lot of gold particles caught on the sleeves board. Normally, the question is, how do you select your mat for the sleeves board? At the moment, there are so many types of mats that small-scale miners use. They normally call these Chinese blankets. It can be towel, it can be astroturf, it can be Chinese blanket, or it can be corduroy material. Our experiences show that when you usually go for the Chinese blanket, these are very good in catching coarse gold particles. But then all the fines will be washed to tails. And therefore, any small scale miner who uses only the Chinese blanket will catch only the coarse particles and all the fines will go to tails. But then if you want to catch all the array of particles in your material, it will be preferable to start with the Chinese blanket, continue with the corduroy, and end with the towel. So that on one sleeve board, you can have all the three mats sitting on it. So that the Chinese blanket will catch the coarse particles, the corduroy will catch the medium sized particles, and the towel will catch the friends. If you are able to do that, you can maximize the collection of gold particles on your sleeves board. But at the moment, many of them are doing it this way, only this way. And our interactions with them, um, we are trying to impart this little information so that they can increase their gold recovery and optimize the resource. After getting their gold concentrate from the sleeves board, they go through secondary operations by panning. 
and from the planning operation they will get the final concentrate which they would eventually add mercury to so you add your mercury and normally they would use their powers to force the gold to get into the mercury by the normal amalgamation process we all know that mercury is toxic and therefore by doing this they expose themselves to mercury intoxication you collect your amalgam you squeeze out excess mercury and then eventually you get this amalgam we are saying that it's a simple thing instead of squeezing the mercury and the oil particles together to get your amalgam rather when you get your concentrate just pour it into a small bottle maybe some of these waste bottles that are sitting in front of us and then after that put the lid on and then shake the bottle by shaking the gold and the mercury will come together and at the end of the day when you pour it out the amalgamation will be complete you do not have any contact with the mercury and this is a safe way of using the mercury in case you have to these are little little technologies but then they add up to make the system safer we see somebody here this is an amalgam in fire and he's blowing air from his mouth to cause the retorting to take place some also use the fireplace at the end of the day you get what we call the sponge gold which can later be smelted to get your bar or whatever you call it so here's a typical fireplace for smelting the sponge gold and at the end of the day they get the gold out many people have used mercury and it came out clearly from a study that there was a lot of mercury intoxication in the communities around um bogoso area in a study conducted at dumase by um, UN, it came out clearly that in a town called dumase mercury was having um, a negative effect on the health of the people and the public health of people in japan all those areas were also being affected so we try to find out the circumstances under which mercury is lost and how we can capture them. There were spills during amalgamation, poor amalgam distillation also used, leads to loss of mercury, disposal of amalgamation tailings, and further processing of the sponge gold were areas that brought about loss of mercury. The study was done at Dumasi and it came out clearly that out of the 187 people who were um, used for the study, a lot of them, especially the females, complained of health perceptions that were associated with mercury intoxication. Females were captured here because they have a lot of fatty parts around them. Um, I think you know what I'm talking about. So, though both men and women were affected, um, the women were affected more. About 90% complained of metallic taste in the mouth. We had about 65% talking about sleepy disorders. We have 20% talking about tremors, and all these are symptoms of mercury intoxication. But sometimes, because small scale miners drink a lot, when they have the tremors, they think that it's the effect of alcohol. The natural fat is the effect of mercury. So, for those who allowed us to do direct biological sample analysis on them, we took blood samples, urine samples, hair, and then fingernails. Um, the blood would normally register urine because mercury is lost through urine. And those of you who have hair, um, when your hair is being formed, it takes a concentration of mercury in your bloodstream into the hair. I can, you cannot use my hair to test it anymore. <laughs> so it came out clearly that the maximum standards, though the health standard was about 25, the blood some were registering about 96. Though the health standard was 50, the urine some were registering wow. 252. Though the health standard was 10, the hair some were registering 44. You could see clearly that some were even actually urinating the mercury directly. Yeah. And, uh, you could even use their urine for amalgamation. <laughs> so it became clear that something had to be done about what was going on to bring a little bit of um, sanity in the system and improve upon the public health of the people in these mining communities. So. The issue was to reduce mercury use and also to reduce mercury loss. In terms of reducing mercury use, this was when we were part of the Ghana Mercury Abatement Project. Two retorts are in the system at the moment. One is a steel retort 
the small scale miners do not use it. Mainly because, according to them, they don't see what is happening inside that box. <laughs> and since they know that people have spirits around them, they believe that if you are doing your amalgamation and somebody with the stronger spirit around you, you can actually pull your gold out of it and um, it will reduce what you are earning. The other disadvantage was the fact that the gold came out slightly colored and that gave them the opportunity to say we don't want it. United Nations introduced this term mix return, where you put your gold here, you unscrew this, you put the gold there and you bring it close to a heat source and um, you heat it. The mercury distills off and you can collect your um, gold at the end of the day, the sponge gold. The challenges with this retort happen to be the fact that um, the glass was too fragile for the small scale mining system. And there were no replacement parts. So with time when the glass breaks, then you cannot use it again. And based on these two challenges, um, at UMAT we develop what we call the lantern retort. The lantern retort combines the faceting conductivity of steel and the see-through effect of glass. So the glass is here. This is a more like a quartz tubing that can withstand about 1,500 degrees. And the steel base allows the distillation to take place faster. The advantage of this is that it is fast and at the same time the people can see. The major challenge with this technique is, the, is its reproduction. Um, the thing was fabricated by some people at Bogoso Janchin in Takwa with a design from us. After we tested it and it started working, we did about 20 of them and gave it to small scale miners. Now go and try it and give us a feedback. And based on your feedback, we can improve upon the technology. Now it appears it is working for them, but it's a fabrication which is a problem. At the moment, I received several orders, about 100, to produce 100 of these um, lantern retorts for small scale miners. The question is, how do I fabricate them? You go and see this artisan, he says, oh, okay, I'll do it. A month down the road, you go there, and he has not done it. Next week, I have an appointment with Christo Asafo. I'm going to see them whether they can help me with this. So that I give them the design, and then they fabricate, and they sell. And of course, they give me a little kickback for my guess. <laughs> I'm hoping that it will work, so that more of these retorts can come on the market, and then we can solve this problem um, of mercury intoxication in our system. The direct smelting method, which was part of the Ghana Mercury Abatement Project, also tries to totally re remove the mercury out of the equation, especially in these days when Ghana has signed on the Minimata Convention. Ghana has actually ratified that convention, and that means that very soon it will become difficult for somebody to import mercury into Ghana. So before that time gets to that point, it is important for us to work hard to make sure that we have a mercury-free system so that by then we can still have our mining without mercury. So we are saying for the direct smelting that when you get your final concentrate, instead of adding mercury, let's go smelting like the light scale miners do. We did work in the lab and we came up with the exact weights of black sand that should go with some borax and also some soda ash. But no small scale miner carries an electronic balance to his field. So we came up with these tomato puree cans. That if you have one tomato puree can of black sands, add two tomato puree cans of borax, two tomato puree cans of soda ash. Mix them and you are ready to go. You don't need an electronic balance, just tomato puree cans to make it simpler for everybody to use. So in this method, you mix the materials, you put it in the crucible and you put it in a furnace. We developed two furnaces, a charcoal-fired furnace, which now we don't use anymore, and then a gas-fired furnace. We designed this gas-fired furnace, and at the moment, the small-scale miners themselves call it the Sikabuchia. So if you go to the terrain, they say this is the Sikabuchia. This is a typical Sikabuchia, not so neat, but it works very well. You have the crucible sitting inside this, and then you have your cylinder which feeds the air. And once you put it inside there, within 20 minutes you can pour and you have your gold coming out directly. So you pour it out, you allow it to cool down in the mold, and when it solidifies and you crack it, your gold will be down there for you to pick directly. This method totally takes out mercury. It is faster, it is transparent, 
And the advantages are that it also recovers gold that are too fine to be picked by amalgamation. Anybody who has done amalgamation before knows that after that you have to squeeze it through a handkerchief. And the handkerchief has got holes that are quite big. And any gold particle which is smaller than the opening in the handkerchief will be lost. But this method will collect all of them. Apart from that, mercury picks only free gold. But this method will help you to get out even the gold particles that are not liberated, but part of the final concentrate. It also modifies the supply chain. Because we know that in the bush, it's the bush buyer that will buy the sponge gold, who will sell it to um, a dealer, who will later sell it to an agent, and who will sell it to an exporter. But this time around, the small scale miner down there can sell directly to the exporter, thereby increasing his revenue. And it will cut out a lot of the middlemen and put more money in the hands of the dirty miner in the pit, which is very important. Finally, we talk about tailings management. If you go to any typical small-scale mining site, you see they are waste scattered all over the place. The rocks, what happens to the material that is discharged from the sleeves board? Many people are falling into pits and dying just because some people died and didn't cover it. So, today we are talking about pra, we are talking about ancobra, we are talking about bia and all those um, disturbed rivers and it's important for them to help us to solve this problem we are talking about good housekeeping and record keeping and trying to check the disturbed landscape and also the abandoned pits we came up with this small pond system for water purification this system works this way the sluice board any small scale miner who wants to use this should dig three pumps, big ones, so that the only interaction that the miner would have with a river body around his area would be the fact that he will pump water from that river body into his pump here. And then he uses his own water to wash gold from the sleeves board. It will go into the first pond where the salt particles will settle and the excess water will overflow into this drain. Here, more certainly will take place. In case you are dealing with very lactritic material, we recommend that you put a little bit of alum here before it drains into the third pond. And by getting to this point, it will be clear enough for you to use it again. If you use this three pond technique, you will not have any interaction with any river body that is in your area. You are not washing directly into it, and you are not taking material directly out of it. And therefore, our waterways will be safe, and we will not be crying over Rapra and Rapra Dinsu based on their color. We are hoping that moving forward we will have more education, more education general in terms of management, but more specifically blasting. In every small scale mining area they blast. If you ask them where did you learn how to blast, they say oh, <laughs> and they just laugh and that is the end. We are saying that <laughs> Small scale miners in every district should select about 20 people. We will take them to the inspectorate division. They will be taught how to blast. They will be issued blasting certificates and they go back to their communities and then they blast for a fee. So that you will not have people just blasting because they think they know how to blast. Because nobody can drive a plane just because he thinks he can be a pilot. It doesn't work that way. We are talking about recovery optimization and here Apart from the 30 to 70 percent that is gravity recoverable, we know that a lot of the fine gold particles are still locked up in the tailings. These tailings are lodged in the bushes all around Ghana and they are being washed away. The question is, is it possible for us to build processing centers where small scale miners can take their waste material to leach the gold and get the extra gold for themselves? Or should they continue selling it to large scale mining companies? In the selling to large scale mining complex is illegal, apart from Sankofa, that has the mandate to um, process tailings. Any other large scale miner that buys tailings from small scale miners is doing illegal business. And therefore, it is possible for us to build centers where small scale miners can carry their waste, or somebody will buy the waste and then go ahead and do it. I think that in the Takwa area, there's so much waste in the system out there. And when you take the tailings and you test it, some are as high as 20 grams per ton. 
already milled. Good business. Yes. Mercury usage, Ghana has signed on to Minimata and therefore we have to stop it. Tailings management, we have to teach them to know it well. And once the education goes forth, the next thing is enforcement. I'm putting education before enforcement because you cannot enforce a law when 70% of the people are disobeying it, when 80% of the people are disobeying it. All our prisons will be filled up. But once you educate them and they get to know what is right to do, then you can enforce. I'm hoping that as the government puts in place a strategy to bring sanity in the sector, we will continue with the education. And when the education has gone forth and people know what to do, then the enforcement will be followed. Thank you very much. It looks like um, you're giving an umbrella um, heading. <coughs> well, thank you very much. Because you know, uh, easily, uh, one, I have two questions. One, you talked about going forward, teaching them how to do very good blasting. My question is, have you come up with a regulation whereby they can get the exclusive? Because from my point of view, when I was dealing with them, they were getting the exclusive illegally. That is one. Second, I'm a little bit scared with this innovation that coming out. With. <laughs> the reason why, being from Obuasi, and looking at our narrow veins, let's say the Kodo Reef, the West Shaft, all those places where the illegal miners were extensive, and you're giving them this technology, I'm afraid it will come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how best we can go about that. <laughs> if they come back again, then I don't think we'll, AJ will come back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, Prof. Uh, gold business is not play matter. The melting point of gold is 1,600 degrees Celsius. Obuasi has been doing gold for more than a century. There's plenty gold in Ghana. The whole of West Africa gold, 70% is in Ghana. So there's more gold in Ghana. But if we are not going to do it right, and we are going to do if anyhow, then we are in trouble. The health statistics you give, chemicals are not play, children's play. Cyanide is very dangerous. And even, I don't want to go to the other chemicals, but mercury is a very dangerous chemical. So allowing them to do it without any safety consciousness, we are killing ourselves. We have to rewrite our laws properly. Even the small scale law that we wrote, we didn't anticipate all these things happening. So rather than we are seeing them, we have to rewrite and change things. What we have done is a very good work. This is mineral processing. Obviously, we use more than 30 chemicals to get a gold. And if you are going to take gold in, not the free gold, but this acinopyrite and all those different things, there are different ways to do it. So, if we allow them to do what they are doing, we are heading for trouble. I'm Atemo Wusu Christopher from University of Ghana. Please, quickly, I would like to know whether, in the, as a part of the package for the training, they are being trained as to the angle of the slate balls, how they can tilt it to also enhance recovery. And uh, you talked about the pond, the three ponds. I would like to know, ideally, what will be the sizes and the depth, because we are running away or we are solving a problem, we may be also running into another problem as respect to underground water. Yeah. Thank you. There's more recommendation. Okay. And um, I see what has been done. They are not too costly to, to develop, mm -hmm. but it's translating theory concept into practice. And um, I would only encourage that the various institutions that are represented here, you know, especially if we are, as we are training mining um, related aspects, that we start some of these concepts out of the classroom before they go to there are various places to give an intention because that facilitates the this learning um, curve, it moves faster and they can connect reality to theory. And I can only commend you on this. Um, I think we can have some discussions around this. We, we as an institution have 
right? Good interest in areas like this. And luckily, our corporate affairs manager is here, so we can, we can discuss that this further. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, somebody may have a license, and therefore, on paper, it is legal. But when you go to the site, you realize that they are doing a lot of illegal activities. So some of the pictures that we took here are actually from legal sites. People holding licenses. Um, the first one talked about blasting and where they will get their explosives from. Indeed, the Act 703 gives small scale miners the right to use explosives. And once they have the right to use explosives, it means that they have the right to buy it. And indeed, at the moment, they are buying and they are blasting. So what we are saying is that let us teach them. The, the legal instrument says you can buy explosives and blast, but nobody has taught anybody how to blast. So we are saying let us teach them how to blast. Let us certify them so that the law that backs their operation can become more operational. Um, in terms, there was a, a, a second one that you mentioned. Have, have I covered both of them? Covered the first one. Remind me of the second one. I'm uh, when they get this technology. Yeah. Um, indeed, at the moment, at UMAT, we are working with Minerals Commission. We are saying that before anybody gets a license to be a small scale miner, he should have done a course at UMAT we now call Certificate in Small Scale Mining and Quarrying Administration. We need people to do that before they can become licensed small scale miners. If Minerals Commission buys into that, then very soon you will not see small scale miners as those riffraffs who are walking around. At the moment at UMAT, we have a full program on small scale mining. And I'm hoping that in the short term, many of our students will not wait for an appointment letter from Anglo Gold. But then they will take advantage of the current scene and then go and do some mining themselves directly. So if people trained at UMAT can work in the large scale mines, the way they do, then I want to believe that they can change the small-scale mining terrain if given the chance. That is what um, the thinking is about. Um, in terms of the temperature at which gold um, melts and all those things, small-scale miners, anybody who knows the terrain knows that these at the moment are melting gold. So it's not a new thing that we are talking about. They do melt gold. Gold melts at 1,063 degrees. And every small-scale mining center, they melt gold. So when we talk about a technique for melting gold, yes, um, we will train them well. The fire smoke that you use in your smelting room, they will put on those fire smokes so that they will do the thing under the appropriate safety conditions. Yes, certainly, when we talk about the sluice board, we look at the angles and we look at the type of mats that will give you um, good recovery. In terms of the three points, the size will depend on the size of the operation. If, for instance, a person processes, let's say, 10 tons a day, and you want a pond that would last for about one year, then based on the production rate, you can develop a pond system that will be very useful. The first pond, with time, will get filled up. So with time, they can dig the material out for other purposes. So eventually, Whatever will happen will depend on the production rate of the person that we are going to work with. And indeed, given the chance, which I believe the government has already given us, we will work hand in hand with Minerals Commission and also with the small scale mining players. And we all together, everybody here, including um, Y, let us team up and help to rescue the sector. Because we all know that in terms of national value addition, small scale mining does better than the large scale mining. And therefore, if we all can team up and help the sector, eventually, we will also reap the fruits of that sector. Small scale mining sector contributes 40% and it feeds about 25% of our population. It's no small means a sector that we think might just wave away. We have to tap on, on them to enforce that they do the right things. But in teaching them or setting up the right systems, in, putting the right systems in place, I think we have to go back and look at policy. Make sure that we inter, 
we communicate with the Minerals Commission and all other bodies that are relevant for policies to be um, formulated that will help us rather take advantage of the industry. On this note, I want to thank you and wish you a good lunch. Thank you.